Hello boys, today we're going to have a throwback into Mafia lore, well Montreal Mafia lore history, going back to the, the Mafia War in the beginning, or around the beginning, the first five years. We're going to tie some, sort of tie some loose ends or try to make some connections. Now fair warning as usual, but I haven't made this warning before actually. First off, the, fur, the fair warning, we talk about Italian people often here because of the Italian Mafia. However, realize that there's organized crime or criminals in every country or every, every ethnicity. It's, a, it's the human condition. It has nothing to do with race. It's going to be very important to remember that because I'm only providing you examples, specific, very specific examples, and they are always Italian. Poor the Italian people. My apologies. If, 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 I don't want to make you guys look like a criminal at all. There's a few percentage that really doesn't represent the whole race at all whatsoever. So that's a very important warning when you watch our content to always remember that there's people who are innocent, a lot of them, too many to count. They're the majority and they shouldn't be suffering over this news, okay? So listen to this as entertainment, inform information, and be careful. Always be careful. Treat your... your Treat them as another fellow Canadian or human being, and and uh, yeah, that's how that's all I wanted to say on that. So God bless them. Now, second thing, fair warning: everything you hear in this show is is an opinion. You know, I'm not in the mafia, <laughs> obviously, and so I read the news. What I try to do is provide you the service, because most more often than not. You're probably not a French guy, a French Canadian, you're probably an Anglophone, maybe in the United States, maybe from New York, or maybe from Western Canada, and I uh, wanted to make this accessible to you by opening up, unlocking the door. So I translate these for you, in other words, if it was not already done, which it wasn't, that's why I'm here. I probably would not have opened the channel if someone already was doing this, and I could just be a spectator. That's how it all started. but. With time, I enjoyed doing this. I found a little place for myself, and I like to translate for you, and I get to have a little bit of fun while doing so. So, fair warning, these are just opinions. I could be wrong eventually, and I'm sure I have gotten a few things wrong. We're trying to make predictions as best as we can. We're trying to interpret the news, pretty much. Raw news coming from journalists in Journal de Montréal or La Presse, for example. But hopefully, more often than not, we will have it right. And so we are just, we are just chatting here, discussing what's relevant in the news. And also, sometimes we do get lucky. We have a commentator who obviously knows more than he should. And there's more than one. And they've illuminated a lot for us. And we thank them a lot over here. All we care about is reaching towards the truth and trying to come out with common sense lessons or knowledge that we could take out of these stories and apply it to the plight of Canadians. So let's get down to business, my friend. You're here for the Montreal Mafia now that we got that out of the way. All right, boys. We're going to look into familiarities. We're going to link the past to the present today. What happened during the mob war 10 years ago, and we're going to see how it re repeats itself today. What are these commonalities and ties? We're going to tie something together. You're going to love it. First thing to tie, look at this. What similarities we have? Funerals and Molotov cocktails. Isn't that familiar? We just saw Marco Pizzi's dealership in Laval getting burned, right? Or attempted to be burned. We saw multiple cars set on fire. And we saw a funeral, Francesco Del Balzo. And in that funeral, we saw black street gang members, right? We actually knew one of them. His name was Rochebrun. We saw a picture of him. Now, I'm not going to make assumptions. Well, I am. Just for our entertainment, look at this for a second here. You see the picture. Funeral again. Mobster again. And you see these pictures, Italians. And I've noticed young males young what does think about this a 50 year old mobster gets assassinated what the hell does a 20 year old black male have to do with this coming to the funeral you ask yourself question what are these young bucks over there for i don't know i'm gonna let your imagination figure this out could they be involved could they be friends of the mobster who was killed there we go we might getting the, might be getting the answers now here's what the article's about 
Here's the face. So this young man here that we see, what's his name? His, his name was Claudio Marco Campelone. Notice this. He was in front of his house when he was killed, it seems. On est devant chez lui, yeah. He was sprayed. Rivière des Prairies. Notice East End. Again, deaths in the East End. You watched our saga of the 1%. You know that's a coveted area. A lot of junkies live over there. A lot of criminal groups reside over there also. We know that Andrew Scopa, that was one of the territories he exploited, right? He was the one unloading loads of cocaine to be sold by various criminal groups. Well, it's always been that way on the East End. If you looked at our saga of the 1%, you know that the bikers, Sylvain Pelletier, controlled that area himself also. The Hells Angels wanted that territory unload their supply. And so we had the biker war and there was tit for tat over there. We know that there was the explosion on the Pelletiers. They killed the brother, etc. Well, we come back 25 years later. We still have people dying in Rivière des Prairies for control over the drug market and at the very top as usual it's the large criminal organizations what we know right now is that that territory according to these articles was locked down and the mafia had their tentacles there and controlling criminal groups indirectly we know that they they can negotiate with street gang members who want access so they could sell it retail in those territories. So it's like a chain of supply that works together, integrated in Montreal, Quebec, of course. Now, let's keep going. Who is this Claudio Marco Campelone? Young man who got killed. And here it shows us that there was a cocktail also thrown, Loris Cavaliere's, Loris Cavaliere's cabinet, right? He was not the only owner there. He was also assisted by Leonardo Rizzuto and Bettina Rizzuto, two children of Vito Rizzuto, both who've become lawyers. Unfortunately, since the passing of the father and killing of his brother, he's no longer following daddy's plan because I think he was supposed to be sort of like a Corleone story, a tragic story. His parents were killed and he's not going to let that slide. He's not going to let all that empire, everything they worked for, go into the hands of the enemy. And he decided that he would follow on his, in his father's and grandfather's footsteps and guard the family fortress. Now, let's get down to business. After these attacks, they had an emergency meeting. Mind you, the articles written in 2015 by none other than Felix Seguin, who does incredible work. After those two events, they did something exceptional. They met in public. Where did they meet? At a certain cafe. This one right here, Cafe Alt. Unassuming from the outside, which by the way, this place existed apparently for about over 150 years, if, not, if my math is not wrong. It was in, I think, 1837? 1837. There you go. Yeah, 1837. Historical. So they went in the basement to be served. And here they, you have them at the table, all dressed up. Who are they? Steven Vogel, Nicola Spagnolo, remember that? Leonardo Rizzuto, meeting at a restaurant. Oh, this one's a restaurant. Restaurant Jargo, du Boulevard Saint, uh, Saint Laurent. So I guess they ate and then they went to Cafe Holt. And why? This is almost the third time that they met in a secret location like this. And the police were able to capture photos of them because they're in public. And look what, he, what the police are saying at that time. Stefano Solicito is not a strong leader. He does not have the charisma of the Godfather. It's difficult for him to arbitrate conflicts, says one of the cops. I'll turn your attention towards the audio tape that we had about uh, uh, Solicito. If we compare what the police are saying here, can we see it making sense? In that audio tape, you could clearly hear him bloodthirsty angry and frustrated and he wanted to make his disappointments known he was willing so to murder people guy, if you hear that eh? conversation you read between the lines he he would look like a bloodthirsty guy he looked like he needed to prove points he looked like people were not falling in line immediately how dare they that was the the gist of the conversation and then you can hear gregory woolley saying yeah yeah but you know i can kill him yeah but you know i can kill him right you know i do a good job i can kill him right that's what the conversation was coming to yeah, yeah, that's right, assert my power. Solicito was happy with Wooly. You heard Wooly. Bang, bang, like a little brother trying to prove himself. Vito Rizzuto, when they say he had charisma, I, to dumb it down for you, I think what they really mean to say is he was likable. People liked Vito Rizzuto. You can make him hang out with a group of bloods and they'll be eating out of his hands by the end of the conversation. You could put him with other mobsters in New York and they'll have a respect for the guy. They'll admire his qualities of his character, for example. I'm, word of mouth goes a long way. Nobody, almost nobody's ever talked bad about him in any of the mountains of evidence that we've ever looked at, me and you together. We've almost never brought up something negative. Rather, it's 
And it's usually something positive. It's interesting to say. You gotta admit this. So perhaps what they mean is Stefano Solicito is not a very likable guy. And I think that if you listen to the audio tape, it might nudge you to that direction. No offense, just my opinions. Someone reading the news, having read the audio tapes, and just being honest with you. Now, we got that one piece out. They were worried, they had secret meetings, they changed plans, they were willing to do it in public, which tells you a lot. Now, what, what, am, I, what am I going with this? Let's go to the next article. All right, so, so far we had Molotov cocktails. We had similar to events that are happening right now. Secondly, the attempt at at hurting your enemies in the East End, or at least the location of the Godfathers or the people involved is in the East End. Again, we see that today. We saw that from the articles from 10 years ago. It's very similar. It's so damn similar. Incendie criminel au CrossFit. So another thing we know, me and you, is that a lot of murders seem to be happening in front of gyms. Salvatore Scopa, and it happened more than once. It happened like maybe three times. I think Francesco Del Balzo's gone like that. Giordano also went out like that. Uh, one of the Scopa brothers went out like that as well in a gym in uh, either it was Laval or West Island. Another commonality that you'll notice, just a side note, it'll always be a gym, it seems like, in the West Island or in Laval. It's one or the two. They love to live in those two areas. Usually you don't pick a gym that's all the way the, across the other world. You know what I mean? You want it near your place. You're sw uh, sweating, you're stinky, whatever. You go back home. Some of, pe some of the people like to sh don't want to shower in the gym. They want to shower at home. They want to come back and replenish, etc. So you want to be sort of closer to home. That's a general rule nobody picks a gym that's that's uh, that you have to go through traffic right so keep that in mind in the future west island laval gyms now talking about gyms the criminal fire on the crossfit in 6183 when was this in 2015 okay it's gonna break a rule here this gym was in saint leonard okay okay is there a reason the other gyms i think that's for people those are not owned by the mob this one might be owned by the mob and that hence why it's in saint leonardo let's check it out la salle de gym visé the gym that was targeted on 6183 de la rue marivaux belonged to according to our documents was the place of work for giuseppe feta if you wanted to hurt Giuseppe Feta, would you just burn the gym he goes to or the gym he owns? That's the real question. I don't think they would be just burning someone's gym who has nothing to do with it. So, 36, Giuseppe Feta worked there, it says. And it underlines the important raffle, the arrest in Clemenza, we know the operations by the RCMP on June 2014, against three cells that traffic stupefiers or drugs for the mafia. And he says that it's the gym owned by Feta, according to Reg... Okay, there you go. Il est même écrit qu'il s'agit du gymnase de Feta. There you go. Mais selon le registraire, according to the Register of Enterprises, CrossFit 6183, that's the name, was to the name of Roberto Bastoni, one of the chiefs, or presumed chiefs, of one of the these cells, which was broken up by the police, hit 2015. The article. Feta was accused of planning gangsterism, complot, so conspiracy, gangst gangsterism, producing drugs in this affair. Whereas Bastone, 43 at the time, was facing accusations of conspiring gangsterism and trafficking drugs, importation of drugs, uh, armed, ra uh, armed aggression, extortion and kidnapping, it says. Bastone did not have any criminal record before that. Whereas Giuseppe Feta, we've already spoken about this man, we've mentioned his name, was equally arrested in 2000. 2006 in the Operation Colisee and condemned for possessing a firearm. Now note, it says, in that period, Operation Colisee, right? What period? We're going to say before 2006, around 2006 or before then. Really important. Feta was considered by the police of having been the strong arm of none other than Lorenzo Giordano, the Redoubtable, l'un des principaux capitaine, one of the chief captains of the Montreal Mafia, targeted and condemned in this vast investigation. According to police, following that, Feta would have arranged his alliances towards, rather, the chiefs that were trying to overthrow the Rizzuto clan between 2009 and 2010. And he has miraculously survived an attempted murder on December 2012, two months after returning in, after the return of Vito Rizzuto. That's a common element. When Vito returned to Montreal, it was almost like a symbolic act as soon as he landed. Because when he landed is almost when bodies of the leadership started to drop. Vito liked to send messages. C'est vers 3h30 ce matin, it's at 3.30 this morning, that fireworkers 
were trying to master a fire that was going on in Jim CrossFit 6183. It says there's been a bit of damages to the neighboring businesses, but they are limited. We don't have any description of the suspect, and the investigation was given to the investigators of the incendiary fires. So they have a division. We have a division in Montreal for everything. You know, soon they're going to have to open a division for trunk of cars. All the bodies found in trunks of cars, man. And here we have the handsome man right here, Giuseppe Feta. There you have it. Okay, so now we talk. We spoke briefly of Francesco Del Balzo. We spoke of Lorenzo Giordano. We spoke of their underlings. So we just mentioned his underling of uh, Lorenzo Giordano, right? And we know that Lorenzo Giordano was a captain, right? And we know that Lorenzo Giordano and Francesco Del Balzo, they were in the streets and they were managing the extortion. They were managing some gambling operations. They were making it work, in other words. But eventually, today in 2023, you know, hindsight is 2020, we know that Francesco Del Balzo got clipped. And we know that he was going to take over all these operations. And he was not just going to hand them over to the spoiled. I'm, I'm just, I'm using this for your entertainment, for you get the situation a little bit but the spoiled son of a godfather who never had to make his bones who did not have to build this criminal empire whatsoever he was not kicking doors man he was studying for the bar test and so del balzo had the biggest balls he thought that his experience could trump the name the ancestor's name and didn't work out well for him because loyalty is not optional in this Catholica Heraclia social caste system, especially if one wants to breathe the finest particles in Montreal's air, given the current forest fires, which I hope they quelch soon. But who would have known that loyalty can transcend blood sometimes? It can spill blood even that crew that cell remember del balzo was wiped out lorenzo's wiped out but what if i told you their leader is still alive they answered to somebody and that somebody used to answer to vito rizzuto if this person's still alive and he's still in good standing which he probably is that means he cut ties with del balzo but today i'd like to go back in time revisit these three characters it'll be great for those who just joined us recently to give a little summary of these fruitful characters and also keep their names alive for our entertainment of course may they rest in peace now this man is probably one of the smartest gangsters possible in montreal one of the oldest ones montreal mafioso lutte de pouvoir appréhendé so he was apprehended when was this francesco Art arcady november 22nd 2006 ex intermediary chief of the montreal mafia and his lieutenants want to retake their place interesting in 2015 after all that they were starting to come out of jail the underlings and they wanted to grab a piece of all this it was time the old generation or certain cells. A nouvelle lutte de pouvoir risque d'éclater. So in 2015, they were worried that the return of Del Balzo's team or his faction could cause violence. And here's what it's saying here. We want to retake control, have said Francesco Arcadi, Lorenzo Giordano, and Francesco Del Balzo at the head of a new table of mafias that was formed after the death of Vito Rizzuto, has learned Le Journal de Montréal. According to our sources, the three men incarcerated since Opera Operation Colisée in 2006 tr are transmitting messages that are clear to the new head of the Montreal Mafia, Stefano Solicito. For the last couple of weeks, et ce même si le trio ne sera libéré, and even they've been sent, apparently they've been sending out this message even before they left jail. That's what it's saying here. Note, they weren't even released yet. Isn't that something that we, we did not spend enough time on? The inevitable clash, if you look at this, the inevitable clash between Solicito's faction and Del Balzo's faction. Could this beef be something that we glossed over? Something important? Something that's not mentioned enough? D'après nos informations, un conflit de génération. According to our information, a conflict of generation is being drawn between these two roads. 
a reputation. Dont le règne est marqué par l'accalmie, le partenariat avec. Basically, saying there's a conflict between two generations. Two cells, if you will. One's coming out of jail. It's clear as day. The other one's out. He's not as charismatic as Vito Rizzuto. People don't like him. It's clear. And other people have uh, they have a fiery character. Like Del Balzo has a fiery character. Francesco Arcadi has not always had the unanimity in the in the mafia. Reminds us Pierre Champlain, an ex-analyst for the RCMP. He was less subtle, this Francesco Ar Arcadi says, in his ways of solving problems as a mediator like Vito Rizzuto. So after his death, seniority, the importance of the opinion of Francesco Arcadi cannot be understated. So as someone who holds this much weight, he was still not able to take Vito Rizzuto's place and bring people together. However, it does not change the fact that he was trying to retake control. And this sparked problems, in other words. Calabrian in origin, it says. The one who we nickname Compare Franco made his bones in the classes of the Catroni clan before becoming a soldier in the Rizzuto clan, it says. Quote, when Vito Rizzuto was imprisoned, Arcadi was named street boss, charged of operations, the discipline, and street soldiers. He was loyal. He would have done anything for the Rizzuto's, added Monsieur de Champlain, an author of many books about the mafia and organized crime. Now here's the part that I really wanted to get into that I forgot to mention. We saw Salvatore Scopa documentary, and we saw he talked about a book. Remember the books, the books, the books. One of the most important questions about the books is, who's holding it now? Who ended up with the books? Salvatore Scopa mentioned torturing people. And remember, we had the underboss of the Rizzuto family, Paolo Renda. I believe it's him. It's either him or Francesco Arcadi. I keep mixing these two. Paolo Renda is missing. He was kidnapped at gunpoint. They found his car with the doors open, if I'm not mistaken. And they, but they took him away. He was probably tortured. Why would you think they would torture him if anything else you would assume that the advisors of the of the Rizzuto's would be someone like him that would be holding the honors of protecting that book of peering at it so the article goes back into the book itself let's read the return the much weighted return of Arcady and of his band will likely be fit with ambushes there'll be tons of ambushes or traps Arcady and his two Loyal lieutenants, Giordano and Del Balzo, rest in peace both of them, both be seeking the book or the documents where they have consigned their revenues for all the illegal sports betting so they can go collect on these clients. And the holder of this book also has a summary of all rackets owned by the criminal group. Before their imprisoning, the book was held by lieutenants of Arcadi. Here we go. Lorenzo Skunk Giordano, Francesco Chit Del Balzo. But it says that it afterwards went into the hands of Roger Valiquet, assassinated in Laval in 2013. Since that day, the book has been under the hands of Stefano Solicito, called the sauce in the criminal underworld it says because he was shaking the mafia's business as he was shaking sauce or mixing sauce solicito whose father is rocco was a loyal ally of the defunct godfather vito rizzuto and he's sitting at the table as a mediator and apparently he would still be sending money to the trio who are who are still under arrest and he's saying it's in order to try to fix the relationships but stefano solicito for the past couple of months is fighting a cancer and his flamboyant style the police of the spvm have often seen him at the helm of a white lamborghini it says with rims golden plate rims on the saw in avenue bernard on the street bernard in outremont those who don't know outremont's near uh, near cote de neige it's on the blue line of the metro if anyone's ever taking the metro you could say it's sort of the center let's say it's the western central part of the Montreal Island, if you will. A little bit more towards the north, I think. Here, look at this. Sources say, equally, that the Rizzuto family has always blamed the Calabrian Arcadi for the 
eventual explosion or creation or i guess it's saying of no no he's, he's literally saying for the collapse collapse of the syndicate the italian syndicate for organized crime in the middle of the year 2000s i find that interesting that they're blaming arcady if that was the case arcady would be dead right now arcady and his crew were imprudent Oh, talking about the operation, I see, Colise operation. Arcadia and his crew were imprudent. They spoke too much on the phone. And it's because of him that the RCMP was able to gain access to secrets of the family during Operation Colise. There you go. Makes sense. Okay, they were a little bit angry at him for mistakes, you know? That's what they mean. Gotcha. Let's see if we can get catch any good. Nothing good here. Nothing, nothing, nothing we do not know already. But you see, this is Francesco Arcadia, and it says that he rallied to the Rizzuto clan in 1984, after the death of Vic Catroni, his life is often under threat. Made fois filmé par la RCMP. <laughs> Look at this quote. This is a quote from him during the uh, investigation. You tell him you don't ever touch my guys. If not, I'm going to slice your throat like a sheep. That's pretty good. <laughs> At <-il> donné, <laughs> he gave one of his underlings. A mission to do on December 8th of 2002, <laughs> according to, oh my God, supervisé trois groupes de porteurs, de portateurs. So he was supervising three different cells that were importing cocaine, as well as supervising the international or the well the sports betting business that they had. Right, that Del Balzo was the arms and legs to make it happen, of course. And he was condemned to 11 years in 2008. Of course, when we say Canada, you know, 11 years, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in for someone doing time. I'm not a guy who's advocating putting people in jail, increasing your time or anything. You have to understand. I just find it insanity that they give sentences and it's an imaginary number <laughs> that's being served by an imaginary person. He's not, he's not doing those 11 years. So why not just be honest with it and say we're sentencing you to four years or five? Why tell us you're being sentenced to 11 if you're not going to be doing that 11? It's insane. I'm more concerned about the mass shooters that they're releasing. They're not even batting an eye about it. But when it's our criminals, we already shame them enough. However, when it's our judges who release these guys, nobody bats an eye. You try to make sense out of that, my dear brother and sister. Can we have our own voice at least over here and not be censored? Anyway, back to the story. 52 bras droit de Francesco Arcadi. Rest in peace, man. You could see how quickly he aged. You look at this picture, and then you look at the end of his life. He looked like a, like a grandpa by the end. Crazy how that went fast. He had a $1.1 million home in Laval, a Ferrari, a Porsche, a BMW. <laughs> Oh my God, how are you gonna stay? How are you not gonna attract the police? How? Condamné à 10 ans, yeah. Condemned to 10 years in 2009. That's why they could kill him less than, what, five, five years later? And then we have the man who was the man of the hour for us. In his face, you can see he didn't have a conscience anymore. He was all about the money. And you, if you crossed this path, he had an objective to do. You were, you were not... You were just going to be a casualty of this man. He was a wrecking ball. And I don't mean just by appearance. I mean he was a wrecking ball. 45 years old at the time. Lieutenant of Francesco Arcadi, implicated in bookmarking, bookmaking, sorry. And the collection business. Look what he, that's what he said on one of, one of the wiretaps. You had a few ceramic work in Montreal. Well, we'd like that you not come here anymore. Because the next time, you won't leave this place. Got it? You've been warned. It's finished. Merci, bonjour. <laughs> oh, shit. At Silzio Telefon, he said to a entrepreneur in the Quebec region on January, 20, uh, January 17th, 2004. The recording was, uh, was shown in Commission Charbonneau which was the inquiry into Quebec corruption. Of course, how they infiltrated the Quebec real estate industry. No surprise there. And he would use the casino of Montreal to go gamble. Interesting, isn't it? Take money from illegal gambling and go bring it to a legit gambling joint to launder it, man. Can't make this stuff up, guys. 
can't make this stuff up it's hilarious 11 years condemned to 11 years well we know how that worked right those 11 years he was he was not worried he was already preparing a comeback and he wanted to take it all after a while i think after a while he said what am i doing man my internship's over i'm not doing no internships anymore and i'm not gonna be your slave and he paid for it man he paid for it see yeah Look at this. Francesco Arcadi was starting to get pissed off at street gangs as well. He did not like them. He was comparing them to monkeys. There you have it. That they are growing like mushrooms in 2006. That's his words. And it says that, in fact, he was beaten up by a street gang member inside of jail in saint anne des plaines in 2009. So they actually... <laughs> Look, selon Pierre Champlain, that's crazy. Look, the, the police, this is a while ago, guys. Remember, man. According to police analysts, they're saying that if Arcady's trying to ignore street gang members or trying to minimize them or trying to isolate them, like keep them out of business, if you know what I mean, he's going to have a lot of problems doing so. That's what a RCMP analyst says. That's what Vito Rizzuto himself said. If I leave this place, all these criminal groups will grow like fire. You won't be able to stop them. They are the new emerging threats. Not my words, Vito Rizzuto. Here's what the RCMP analyst says. Not only are street gang members playing a certain role in what happened in the mafia by being accessories to these murders, but they have become an undeniable part of organized crime, I'm adding. In the city hence he or Katie, will have to show evidence of diplomacy with them if not a clash will be inevitable think about that have clashes become inevitable by certain mobsters getting killed by street gang members I think we have had enough evidence of this we spoke about a certain Kevin Rochebrun did we not Yes, new man of the hour. And we saw how he was suspected by the police of having been part of many killing incidents against the Montreal Mafia. So I'll leave you with that. What can we see? What can we learn? We can learn that compared the past to today, there are still Molotov cocktails being thrown, still places being burned. We still have street gang members proving that they're not here. They're not here to go. They're here to stay. And we have seen that Francesco Arcadi's battalion has been wiped out. His his initial team members, of course. So what is he doing now? That's my question. Where where does he stand in all this? How is he gonna make his money from now on? Does he have the replacements already? We have not found his body yet either. So I would assume. If someone should have been killed, if he was guilty of any sins towards Leonardo Rizzuto, it would have been him. Yet, we have not heard about a, a body being found yet. So, my question will be for the foreseeable future, what is his role? And who are his new lieutenants, if at all? Or did he just happily retire? He has no choice, he's very old. Does he really want to be part of this mess? It seems like it's a young man's game. It seems like if you're over 65, you should forget about it. That's my opinion anyway. I'll leave you guys there. Let me know what you think. If I made any mistakes or if you can add any detail to the story, guys, let's do it. Do it. Don't do it for me. Do it for the others. Do it so we can... The less mistakes I make, we can keep going forward and have a better uh, understanding of the future. That's it. Thank you so much, my friend. Have a good one. Take good care of yourselves. And if you haven't already, subscribe to get the latest on the Canadian Mob Wars.